road she traveled. I know women who made a difference. A cool kids gift to our community. Welcome to a personal interview of Barb Gibson, conducted by Cindy, on April 18th, 2007. Okay, when you were growing up, did you do gymnastics? I did, yeah. I started gymnastics when I was seven years old, and I was one of those kids in a neighborhood that was um, just always on their hands. You know, doing cartwheels and trying to do handsprings down a hill. And I had a best friend, and that's what we did for all of our playtime was do a lot of tumbling. And um, so pretty soon, her parents and my parents got together and said, well, why don't we get those two into some gymnastics lessons? And so at that time, um, there really weren't such things as gymnastics clubs, um, but there were Y programs. And the Ys had uh, tumbling classes and um, as well as gymnastics and so we went down and we um, joined the Y that was a really I have to share with you a really difficult decision for my family because I was from a family of nine children and so um, my father was a teacher at a school and he didn't make very much money and it cost $18 a year to join the Y back then but that was a lot of money for my family to spend on a Y membership for a whole year. But my mom and dad decided that um, they would try and come up with the money. And they even had a discussion with my grandma. And my grandma gave $10 toward me joining the Y. And then my mom and dad put in the money. And the next thing you knew is I started gymnastics. And I loved it. And so, yeah, I started at a very young age. So you grew up in La Crosse? No, I grew up in Iowa, um, in a community called Davenport, Iowa. It's a Quad Cities. It's about three and a half hours from here. And then when I went to high school, I actually moved to Dubuque, Iowa. Um, but I did come to college here at La Crosse. And so that's really, I went to uh, the university, UWL, in the early 70s. I left and I taught high school in um, near Madison and then I went and I taught college down in Arkansas and in Pennsylvania and then believe it or not I came back to UWL. So you were a teacher was that your first dream to be a teacher? Well that's another interesting story that's linked actually to when I went and joined the Y because um, when I joined the Y and started gymnastics I had um, a Y coach who asked me to help her on Saturday mornings in her house because she in her basement had tumbling lessons and dance lessons and she said to me if you come and help me on Saturday mornings in my basement teach three four and five year olds um, gymnastics and dance then I will give you free Y lessons and so she really I would I think got me started in teaching. I mean, I really started teaching little kids when I was nine and 10 years old. And that was the way that I evolved in my whole gymnastics career was I started very young. And then really when I went away to college, I just knew I wanted to be a teacher and a coach. And so, um, yeah, I started at a very young age finding something that I really loved. So you went to school to be a teacher, like a regular teacher, and then you started out to be a gymnastics teacher what year? Um, well, I, when I graduated from the university, I had a double major. Okay? My major was in health education and physical education, and I had a coaching concentration. And when I left the university, which was in 1978, I went and taught health and physical education at a high school in Sauk Prairie, Wisconsin. And I did that for two and a half years. And I coached gymnastics. And I also coached in high school softball. Um, then I decided I wanted to teach and coach at the college level. So from there, I went and uh, got my master's degree at Southern Illinois University. And then I went to Arkansas. And I taught and coached at a college. Um, what do you think was the biggest accomplishment in your life? Mm. That's a really hard question because I, I don't know if I can pinpoint one particular thing. Certainly, um, 
I've had success in my job, um, which I'm very proud of because I've worked very hard with a large number of teams and athletes and helping them realize their potential. And so, you know, we've had 11 national championships at, at UWL. Um, and we've had numerous national champions and all Americans. And those are things that professionally I'm very proud of. But I'm also really proud of the fact that um, I have three children and that I've been, I think, a very effective um, and good parent and good mom while I have worked. And I think that that is um, a truly a challenge is to find a balance in your work and in your personal life. And I, you have to work really hard at both of those to have a successful marriage to be a successful parent and then to be a successful professional. And so I, I think it, as I reflect now, I'm probably most proud that I continue to work on being successful in my personal life and my professional life. Um, you had Coach of the Year for, was it three years? Yep, I've been the national coach of the year um, several times. That's what this little honor right here is. The most recent was in 2005, and that means nationally they selected me as the coach of the year, which was a tremendous honor. I've also been recognized within my own conference several times too. Um, how did you feel when you got there? Um, very proud, you know, excited, um, but also I'm not a person that um, enjoys kind of that attention, and um, so I'm also kind of one of those people that I'm pretty humble in that that kind of uh, recognition is a, almost a little embarrassing for me. I, I don't know if I just don't like that all focus right on me at that time but I certainly can remember in the gym holding the award as it was announced and people clapping and you know there was a lot of excitement but I also I have to tell you I was anxious to get off that stage <laughs> like okay I want to go over here where nobody's going to see me <laughs> so I'm not sure what that is in me but that's part of my personality I think is that your most remember rememberable award <sighs> oh gosh Again, no, I can tell you right now, absolutely not. Like to receive that accolade is not, um, doesn't, won't be one that I'll just stand out forever. Um, I am really proud of uh, some of my athletes when they have stood up on the award stand and I see them be successful because I, I get a lot of sense of, of accomplishment when I can see that they were successful and that I had an impact. So I get a lot a, a lot more out of seeing them be successful than personally for me to be successful. Even though I know I had an impact on their success. Does that make sense mm -hmm. to you? Yeah. So, you know, I when I am in the stands and they're up there, I'm very proud. <laughs> um going back to your gymnast, mm -hmm. um what do you teach them about their weight and dieting? Weight and dieting. Well, I, I really try to just reinforce to them two things. One, continue to move throughout your whole life. All right, so even though your love has been gymnastics, to be a healthy person, you need to move every day. That doesn't mean you have to go out and run five miles every day. You just need to say to yourself, what moving did I do today? Keep moving. And the second part is that they need to obviously watch what they eat. Moderation is the key. And that's the same thing that I say to them even when we're in gymnastics training. They need to be in the weight room doing our strength program because as athletes, that's what's gonna make us better. So they know that that's part of our program and they know that I would be disappointed if they didn't do that. And so really it's not I'm having to tell them it's a choice for them. 
do they want to get better? And if they want to get better, then these are the things that you do. It's just like in life. If you want to be healthy, you're going to need to move. And you're going to need to move probably every day. And you're going to need to watch what you eat. It doesn't mean you have to diet. It doesn't mean you have to not eat certain foods. It means everything that you're going to need to do is going to have to have moderation. I mean, if we sat and ate bags and bags of M&Ms every single day, we know that that's not real healthy for us, right? Yeah. You know, I'm a red licorice person. I know if I get those that bag of red licorice and I just eat that every single day, that most likely I'm just going to get a lot bigger. <laughs> I need to say, you know, moderation. You know, can I have a little of that? Yes. I don't need to say no to everything, but I have to also balance those choices with moving every day. Um, do you think you as a coach impacted your gymnast life in any way? Well, I hope so. <laughs> I hope so. Certainly the coaches I had um, impacted me in some way, positive and negatively. Mm -hmm. Meaning, when I say negatively, I mean there were things that some of my coaches did that I'll go, I'm not going to do that. You know, I saw them do that. I had a coach, believe it or not, in college. Now, this is a long time ago, but who smoked and smoked in practice. When we were on the uneven bars, he would take his cigarette out of his, out of his mouth and he would put it in the T-handle of the uneven bar. Now, just imagine if you were at a track practice and you had a track coach who every time that you were coming up to get some instruction was smoking, all right, and blowing the smoke in your face. I mean, it's crazy to even think about that nowadays because we know so much more about secondhand smoke and how all the negative impact of fire. Yeah, exactly. And, but in the day that I was growing up, that was commonplace, okay? That was often done. And so I learned, mm, boy, I'm not gonna be that kind of coach, all right? You know, so th there are things that you learn from different people that have a positive impact on you or could have a negative impact on you. And then you have a choice to alter, you know, what you're doing. But what was your question again, specifically? Um, do you think the... Oh, do, have I had an impact? That, yeah. I think that was your original, the, have I had an impact? Um, I think, you know, if you asked my athletes, they would say yes. And um, so I, I hope that they would say in some way it's in a positive manner. Yeah. Um, are you in any organizations or were in any organizations besides gymnastics, like helping people and stuff? Um, boy. No, but I think we do, you know, within our gymnastics team, we do a lot of things to help people in our community. Um, our team helps run uh, the Stepping Out in Pink uh, breast cancer walk um, that occurs in the, in the fall at Gunnarsson Lutheran Hospital. Um, we do two different workshops with the Girl Scouts, helping them um, earn a fitness badge. Um, and we you know, typically do, do about yeah, anywhere from three to 400 Girl Scouts every fall that we um, engage with them. Um, I'm certainly very involved in uh, the L Club, which is uh, an organization that supports UWL athletics. I'm on the executive board of that. Um, I've been a supporter of the Women's Foundation uh, and Women's Fund here in La Crosse. So um, indirectly or directly, um, either through myself or through my team, we do a number of different things. Kids Night Out, we're very involved with. Uh, we do a um, uh, National Girls and Women in Sport Day to encourage young girls to participate in gymnastics. We run a Junior Eagle gymnastics program at the university that we have over 200 little girls in the community that have an opportunity to learn gymnastics. Um, so yeah, I think I think I do a number of different things to try to be an advocate for all young girls that may have an interest in gymnastics, and that um, you know we we provide lots of opportunities at the university for that. Um. Did your 
parents impact you in life too? Oh boy, my dad was, a, he had a huge impact. My dad was a teacher and a coach. And I have a picture of him right here. This is him. And he passed away 10 years ago. Yeah, he had a heart attack. So it was very sad. But he had a great impact on me. <laughs> and did your mom have a good impact on you too? Yeah, and you know what? I think, you know, remember I kind of said a few minutes ago about um, trying to be a good parent? I, my mom was just, you know, a stay-at-home mom, nine kids, and I think I learned a lot about being a good mom from her. <laughs> Do you have any special dreams for your children? Oh, that's a great question, too. Um, hmm. You know what I hope for my children? I hope that they can have the kind of life that I've been fortunate to have. Because um, what I've been able to do is do something that I love. I don't, I don't have a single day where I feel like I am going to work. Okay, and I don't know if you can fully understand that, but like for me, it's enjoyable to go to work. And the best part of my day really is when I get to teach at the university and when I get to coach. And when I'm really engaging with students, that is fun for me. That is not work. And when you are working with college students who really want to learn, all right, they're there because they have chosen to be there. They have goals and aspirations. It's a really motivating environment to be around. And so for me, I hope my children um, will be able to choose careers that they will be so fortunate to want to really just go and enjoy each day. And I think the key to that is, and I try to give this advice to my children is choose something you love. You know, something you really are motivated by. Because when you find that, you know, think about a class that you might like. And you go in and you have a teacher that you really um, like a lot too. And what happens to you when you have that? You get motivated. Yeah. Okay, you know, it's like you're excited about that. And suddenly, you know, you walk in there and you have a whole different kind of attitude about it. And see, that's, that to me is what my job is every single day. I, you know, I just have, I think, a really great attitude and, and I'm a very positive person. And um, it's because I enjoy so much what I do. And I think, too, part of the success that I have had is a result of really that positiveness and that kind of energy that you create. And then other people around you, guess what happens? Kind of gets contagious, you know? All of a sudden, they are doing a little bit better and they enjoy it a little bit more. And next thing you know, you just got, you know, something that's a lot stronger than what it, it was initially. Um. If you could pick anybody in the world, who do you think helped you fulfill your dream in life? Oh, my dream. Well, I have to give a lot of credit to my husband. All right? Because and that's him right there. Um, and we've been married 25 years. And... Um, he has just always been really supportive of my choice of wanting to be a coach. And you have to recognize that coaching, the world of coaching and athletics, requires a lot of time. All right, you're in, in the athletic environment a lot of hours. For example, if I were to tell you what my Fridays were like <coughs> during my season, just Friday. Right. I teach in the morning at 7.45. That means I have to get to work by 6.30 because I have to set up gyms, five different gyms all right, at the university because 
I teach a wellness class and I direct it. And so there I am at 6.30 on Friday morning getting that ready. And then I teach at 7.45, 8.50, 9.55. So the first three hours I'm teaching. Then I'm going to be leaving on a bus for a meet at 1 o'clock. And I might be traveling, let's say, down to Whitewater, Wisconsin, or to Oshkosh. Well, I travel there, and that's a three-hour trip. Then I go, and we warm up, and then we compete. And after we compete, we feed the athletes. And by the time you're getting back on the bus, okay, it's about 10.30, 11 o'clock at night. And now you're just heading back to lacrosse. All right? So now you get back. Let's say most hours I was... I was getting back to lacrosse during the season between 1.30 and 2 a.m. Well, what time did my day start? 6.30. Mm -hmm. Well, that was 6.30 when I was at the office, okay? My day started really when I had to get up, which was 5.30. Are you following me? Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a very, very long day. And in the same time, that's just my schedule. Now when you have children and you have family, who do you think is there trying to coordinate them getting to basketball at the Boys and Girls Club or? Brother and dad. <laughs> exactly, someone else. <laughs> or a babysitter, yeah. you know, because I've hired college students to help us. So, <laughs> you know, we certainly have had to really have, um, you know, a good, a person who understood, you know, all of the time commitment. Now, you have to remember, gymnastic seasons <coughs> don't go forever. You're talking three and a half months of your year that things are crazy, you know. But when you have somebody who's supportive of that and who is picking up a lot of the extra kinds of things to be, you know, to run a family, you know, you can't help but say that that person doesn't, you know, have had a tremendous impact and influence and has assisted you probably the most. So. Um, what road led you to live in the cross? Hmm. Well, what occurred was um, I had been a student athlete at UWL. I had um, been at the university and realized, you know, what a, an excellent exercise and sports science department they had um, and I had left as a student I'd gone and worked and then I heard that they had an opening for the gymnastics coach so I just applied for the job and the interesting thing was at the same time they had an athletic training job open well my husband's an athletic trainer so they had two jobs the same place for both of us and so we both applied, and then we both were hired. And so that's how we got here. Um, what was the most exciting part of your life? Exciting part of my life? Hmm. <laughs> well, I would have to say probably, and I don't know if the key word is exciting, but the craziest and that kind of go hand in hand, was when my older two children, now they're both off in college, and they were in high school sports. So um, they went to Aquinas, and both of them were three sport athletes. So they were in a lot of activities. And my son, in particular, was he was the quarterback of the football team, and he was the point guard on the basketball team. And they went to state and won state, and he, they did really well. And as well he was, he went to state in tennis. So the craziest and most exciting period was when those two were at high school, and they were doing all these different activities. And that was just really exciting because it was fun for me as a parent to follow them and to see them enjoy sport as much as I have and I think the coolest part is that none of them have ever done what I love they have always selected other sports and um, to see them succeed in something that they enjoy 
was just really fun as a parent and it was an exciting time. It was crazy from the standpoint, try to coordinate work, life, my team, their schedules, because all I was doing was running from one activity to the next. My husband would get in one car and follow one of them. I'd get in the other car and follow the other. And there were times, um, for example, and I'll share this with you because I think it, it um, uh, when my daughter went to state basketball, I had, she, here she's going to state, and I had a gymnastics meet. I had to be at my regional meet. And so I went to my athletic director, and I said, I need to hire somebody to do my job for a meet because I need to go watch my child at state. And he said, well, you know, I missed a lot of my kids' things. That's just part of what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to miss some of your kids' things. And I said, well, I'm still choosing not to miss her state game because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for her. I have worked here for 20 some years. I have gone to everything and anything. I have done everything. And because I was so insistent, he approved it. And he said, okay, go ahead. You need to hire somebody then. So I paid somebody else to go with my team. Now it is really different, you have to remember, in the world of gymnastics. It's not like a lot of coaches where, like in a basketball game where you're having to strategize and change things based on, you know, a defense that's being out, put out there. Or, you know, as a coach in gymnastics, you kind of do all your homework in the practice gym. All your routines are set. And when you go to a meet, it's the athlete doing the routine. I mean, you're no longer changing things or, you know, having that kind of impact. You know, so I think that had probably some influence on his decision. But in the end, um, I was glad I made that decision because when I think back of having to miss maybe what was one of the most important, you know, athletic times for my kids, I, I was able to be there. Um, do you think, or would you ever want your kids to try gymnastics or did you ever want them to try gymnastics? Oh yeah, they all tried it. They all tried it. They all took lessons. They were all doing it. It just wasn't something that they enjoyed all that much. And when they got to a point where they didn't enjoy it, I just said, okay, what else, what else do you enjoy more? And they always had something. So the one thing I, I believed in was exposing them to a lot of things and then letting them choose. So I think that that was valuable because then they, they really kind of knew. You know, they had an opportunity to take a tennis lesson through park and rec, you know, to, to do basketball over at the Boys and Girls Club, to try um, volleyball with park and rec down at Lincoln on Saturday. I mean, we were always doing different things. So um, I let them decide. Um, okay. Um, what pressures did you feel as a teenager? Ooh, as a teenager. Um, one particular pressure in my high school, and back when I was in high school, 18 was the drinking age. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so you had to be 18 to drink. And so what that meant was, um, quite honestly, by the time you were 16, there were some kids drinking, all right, in the, in the schools. And certainly when I would go to a high school party, there were um, people at that party that had been drinking. And so there was always this constant kind of pressure, like they would drink. And unfortunately, where they would drink is they'd drink in their cars. And then they'd come into somebody's house, you know, for a gathering. And so you always had that pressure to, you know, kind of everybody would say, oh, come out to the car. And then you'd come back into, you know, somebody's basement or something. And um, I'll be very honest. I was just, uh, one, I was, I, I didn't want to get in trouble, okay? I wanted to do the right thing. That's just part of who I am. And so, but you always kind of felt that pressure of choice. You know, some people want, were doing this and you wanted to do this. And so you were always trying to, where do I want to fit? Um, the best part was I had 
two good friends. And the three of us decided we weren't going to do that. And you know what? We hung together. Um, and their names were Diane and Tina. And I will never forget, um, I don't know how many times, you know, we would leave parties and say, nope, we're not going to be here. And we'd get in our car and head off someplace else. You know where we'd often go? And we, we laugh now when we go back to high school reunions, but we'd go to the Dairy Queen. <laughs> We called it the DQ, and we'd go to the we'd go to the DQ, and we'd get ourselves some kind of big old shake or something, and sit and just chat and have a grand time. And the other thing we did was we had two guy friends that so it ended up always kind of being five of us. And you know what? That's all it took. It just took a small group of us to say, you know what? We're not going to do what everybody else did. But I can recall feeling the pressure. You know, the pressure of choice. You know that kind of you felt like ah oh, everybody's doing it well you know what everybody wasn't doing it but you just kind of had that sense um what do you think is the most important message you want to get across mm. well i the most important message would be um probably and i've already stated it but it would be um follow your heart you know choose things that really um, you enjoy and that you love because I have been doing this now for 30 years and I am still just as passionate about it as I was 30 years ago so I, I if there's a message to send to young people or to anyone it would be you know follow that which you um, enjoy the other thing is you follow the things that you do well you know, what, as you think about the things that you like, I mean, when you go into a math class, do you like numbers? Do you like science and kind of understanding science? Do you like to write in journals? I mean, what are those things that you just kind of look at yourself and go, oh, these are the things I, I like doing? And just take that as a lead. That will lead you in, in I think, a good direction. Um. What do you think, what do you think your, um, want me to ask one while you think of it? Sure. What are some of your values that have endured and strengthened as your life has progressed? Mm. Honesty. For sure, is one value, um, and with honesty, it's been my integrity. You know, if you if you remember a minute ago, one of the the values that I think, um, and probably my parents instilled in me, was to do the right thing. Now, you know, I'm not sure how that all evolved, or if that was just part of my personality, but I. I have always wanted to kind of do the right thing. Now, in every environment, that's different. But um, I think that, that, along with being honest, and um, my father instilled, and my mother did too, a work ethic. Um, and so I think when you have a strong work ethic uh, and you demonstrate integrity in what you're doing. Um, you have an opportunity to be successful, especially I think in the world of athletics, because I think it's a it's a base, it's a foundation for what needs to be done. I don't think it's different than in any other work environment, though. I, I, my world has been the world of athletics and in teaching, so. Um, but those would be some of the values, I think, that are important. Um, I forgot to ask you in the beginning. Um, when is your birthday? You don't have to say the year if you don't want to. August 8th. August 8th. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> and I don't mind saying that. I'm going to be 51. Oh. <laughs> oh <laughs> Oh, I like that statement. <laughs> well, we've had a lot of older people. Have you? Today, so yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, no, 
Normally, how big are the team, or is your team that you? Yeah, um, usually between 16 and 20 athletes every year. Yeah. How many do you need to compete? Um, six on each event. So in gymnastics, there's four events, and then those six, um, we, so potentially you could have 24, but you, you certainly have some athletes that work every event, they're what we call an all around, and then you have other athletes that maybe only work one event, you know, do just uneven bars or just balance beams. So, um, but not everyone gets to compete on my team. Um, we try to get them in, you know, at least one meet a year, but it doesn't, you know, doesn't always happen. What do you think is your favorite routine? Hmm. Favorite routine or favorite event, do you mean? Either one. Either one. Both. Okay. My favorite event hmm, is probably, oh, wow, I don't know about that one. See, I like them all. <laughs> oh, I like them all. If I had to pick one, for me personally as an athlete, the one that I excelled and did the, the best at was balance beam. And so I, and I really like the mental part of balance beam. Uh, because you have to be so focused and you have to be um, uh, you have to have so much repetition and time on the balance beam in order to be successful coaching wise I spend most of my time at the uneven bars but I enjoy I enjoy floor exercise a lot too so that's a that's a hard one um, routine wise Boy, I've had some athletes that have really excelled. When I think back to some of the routines that we've had, I mean, we've just had some outstanding uh, specific routines, like some national champions on floor exercise that one, one gal did a routine to Michael Jackson's Beat It, and, oh, it was awesome. I mean, I think she was a two-time or three-time national champion with that routine. That's probably one of my favorites. Um. In gymnastics, what do you think was your best year? Or do you have a best year? Best year. Hmm. I can't say that there's one year that stands out over my time over others. Certainly, um, and this might be interesting, some of my best years might not always have been the years that we have won a national championship. Maybe some of the best years have been where my team just really works together as a group and are just, you know, they train like underdogs. You know what I'm saying? Like they just work really hard and they're every single day great effort and they really like each other and the team chemistry is really positive and everything just kind of flows easily in those years. And if we didn't win a national championship, it didn't really matter. Okay, so, um, but certainly there have been years when we've won national championships and all that have been really exciting and really positive too. So, you know, I, I, I can't say um, winning always creates the positive experience for you. Um. What are all the years that you won the national championships? Well, let's see. Um, okay, 1986, That's right. 1988, 1995, 2001, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, 2006. And then this year, we were third place. Oh. <laughs> um, what do you think is, like, every year you have mostly some new sets of girls, and do you think, what do you think is the most strongest event for most girls? Hmm. 
Well, certainly it would be beam or floor exercise. That, that would be for sure one of the two because those two events are the easiest to get what we call in the world of gymnastics the start value. It's what if they did their routine perfectly, what would their score start from? And obviously what you want is you want to start from a score of a 10.0. But some of the routines that, based on what they're doing in the routine, may not be a 10.0. For example, on uneven bars, which is really difficult to get your difficulty, a lot of the routines that we have on our team will only start from a 9.7 or a 9.8. Uneven bars requires the most amount of strength, and it's really difficult to get your combinations of things. Vaulting as well. A lot of the vaults, we only have two athletes on our team that have 10.0 vaults. The majority of our vaults at, at, um, at vault are worth 9.8. So in other words, if they did them perfect, absolutely perfect, they'd score a 9.8. There's no way they could get a 10. Well, they never, you know, our, our level of athlete doesn't get a perfect score. You know, we've had some do really, really well, you know, but, and what I mean by that is maybe their routine was a 9.8 and they scored a 9.65. You know, they had very little deduction. So. Um, um, at the meets, are the judges, like, really picky about, like, really little deductions? Yeah. I mean, like, uh, you know, a little leg separation, a little toe point. Believe it or not, can you, we had one national championship. Like, if you don't point your toe in gymnastics, that's worth one-tenth, point one. Right? Well, we lost, or we won a national championship by 0 0.025. So think of over 24 routines and you had a score difference of less than a pointed toe. I mean, yeah, I, it, you know, scoring really can make a big difference in even the end result and they are very particular. Any kind of leg separation or knee bend is worth two tenths. So a fall in gymnastics is worth five tenths. So you really can, um, you know, either reduce your score or increase your score based on a lot of your form or your um, technique of your skill. How many guys have you had join your team? Through the years? Oh, boy, that's a great question. You know, I'd have to go to my, um, uh, I'd have to look at my media guide because if, if I look at my media guide here, I have, I the all-time roster back here and I'd have to go back through the years but certainly I would guess well, over 300 um do you think as far as athletes go do you think guys or girls are better or do you think that it doesn't matter Mm. Well, I think, you know, girls compete against girls and guys compete against guys. So, you know, we don't have really, um, you know, the opportunity too often to really compete against each other. But we certainly know physiologically that men are going, are stronger than women. Okay, that is just a given. So if I have a runner that means, and I, they're both going to do, you know, a 50-yard dash. We know that the man will be faster than the woman because the man is stronger. He's more powerful. And that's just based on his hormonal system in his body. So, you know, he will be quicker than the female. Now, the female can get pretty close to that male. And have there been females that beat males? Certainly. But... Overall, we know that there's just physiologically going to be differences that are going to enable the male to be, you know, stronger and bigger and probably quicker in most cases. Um, do you think that boy and girl athletes should compete against each other or do you think that they shouldn't? I don't think they should. I think they should be separate based upon just what I just described, that there are physiologically differences and that um, 
we have to recognize those. And you know, you always want in, in sport an opportunity to have fair play. And so, you know, you want to be creating the opportunity for people to go up against um, the people that are on a similar playing ground. So, for example, I, I want women to go against women, and I want men to go against men. <laughs> and that would be fair. Describe an I. Describe an eye-opening experience you had after high school. Uh, eye-opening experience. Mm. Boy, I've had so I had so many. It's <laughs> it's, it's hard to think about just. One, um, you know, when I I think I think to my college days, I think about the interactions that I had with teammates, and um, at all the things that I learned from my teammates about differences in people, right? And to recognize those differences and to embrace them. I learned a lot about that through my team, teammates. Um, my first job teaching high school, I learned um, how to be tougher. Um, I had a student in a study hall who threatened to kill me and it was a horrible, just, he was, had a lot of emotional problems. And it was hurtful toward me for anybody to just kind of attack me like that verbally. And so I kind of learned just to be a little tougher through that experience. Um, I learned about the most about myself since I've had children. Okay, my children having uh, kids teaches you what an impact they have on your life, which is a tremendous impact. Having a baby has tremendous impact on your life. <laughs> Having three kids and then all of the responsibilities associated with that has a tremendous impact on your life. And I, I learned a lot about myself, about how to be patient, how to be calm, and how to be <laughs> all of those kinds of, of characteristics. So, you know, I've had a lot of different I guess situations that I think about when you ask me that. 